Okay, so the last talk is about, is by <coughs> uh, Sebastian Westring from Imperial College of London and also by Richard Shen from the University of Singapore. Uh, Sebastian uh, received his PhD in 1981 from the Department of Mathematics, University of Utrecht. He received a lot of awards, for example, the corresponding members of the Deutsch Royal Academy of Science, Engineering and Physical Science Research Council Review, and a member of IHES, and the very former Senior Research Fellowship. So uh, today he will speak, speak about recent develop, developments in interval dynamics. Let's welcome. It's a great honor to uh, be invited. Uh, I'd like to thank the program committee for, uh, for this. So um, I'd like to talk about um, recent developments in uh, interval dynamics. And uh, in fact, it's been quite a spectacular situation in interval dynamics. It's one of the areas in mathematics where even though the problems are really uh, sophisticated, an almost complete picture has emerged. So um, interval dynamics means that you have a sort of map, a smooth map, you take an initial point and you just iterate it and you consider the orbits. And of course the orbit can be very simple, or rather the asymptotics of the orbit can be simple and become periodic, but it can also converge in a rather complicated chaotic way to a much larger set. And that's really uh, the situation you want to study. And even though you have this very, very complicated behavior, it turns out, and also a lot of nonlinearity, it turns out that, in fact, in some sense, most systems can be understood rather well. And there are several ways you can sort of study this. And what I want to emphasize today is kind of metric structure of orbits. That's really the point of view. And in fact, the second part of the talk by Weishaw, uh, my, uh, the course of this uh, talk, is um, more the ergodic point of view. There's another point of view which actually uh, uh, Artur Avila and Misha Lubic also gave in that talk, which is related to minimization, and that's looking at smooth structures on counter sets, or rather that these are some kind of universality properties which are on counter sets. And the property I want to uh, concentrate in the first talk, of uh, first half of my, uh, my part of the talk, is about global crisis symmetric rigidity. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. So what I want to do is first explain what it means to be crisis symmetrically rigid, what its <coughs> origins are, or what, you know, why it's uh, true, and also applications. So what is crisis symmetry? Crisis symmetry simply means that if you take three points, in the, one in the middle, that the image, it's more or less the middle point is almost in the middle. So you take points x minus t, x and x plus t, and you look at the ratio of the right and the left interval, then it's more or less one. If it was one, it would be linear or affine, and uh, in this case, it's kind of almost linear. So it's not quite smooth. In fact, this implies a holder, but it's something like smoothness property. And in fact, uh, there is a program which is due to uh, Sullivan, um, and I'll discuss that on the next, uh, on the later slide also, which is try to prove something like quasi-symmetric rigidity. And it's saying, well, suppose you have two maps which are the same from a topological point of view, then in fact, they're quasi-symmetrically the same. In general, of course, homeomorphism can be rather complicated. And here it says that, in fact, even though these maps have very little in common, except that the topological orbit structures are the same, that actually automatically this conjugacy will inherit some smoothness. It will be well, almost differentiable. It's not differentiable, but it has this sort of uh, very strong property. And then um, it turns out that this is actually a very important property, and it 
will have a lot of applications. So first I want to, to state uh, a theorem which, in play, uh, which uh, explains that this is something very natural, that this is coming automatic. And uh, remember this is something that the, the property is, is global. So the next statement is the following. So assume you have a circle or an interval, and you take a map, and this map is simply real analytic, and these two maps are topologically conjugate. So up to a topolo topological coordinate change, they're the same, but there's nothing about smoothness there. The maps could be quite different and also have almost uh, no, you know, one could be something like a sine function, another one could be like a quadratic function, so they have very little in common. And now we're going to make two assumptions. Well, look at the critical points. So these are the points where the derivative is zero. And assume that this conjugacy sends the critical points to the critical points. And the parabolic points to the parabolic points. What are parabolic points? These are points where the periodic points, where the multiplier, so the, the amount of expansion, when you come back, is one or minus one in this case. So it's the ones where you don't have exponential behavior. And if you assume that this conjugacy is a bijection between critical points and also between the parabolic points, and in the case of critical points, you also want that if a critical point is of cubic order, that the image also is of cubic order. So the orders have to be the same. And then the conclusion is simply that the two maps are the same, almost in smooth sense, in this quasi-symmetric sense. And this turns out to be remarkably useful, and I will discuss some applications. And uh, let me sort of start by saying this result is sharp, in the sense that if you drop any of the assumptions, then uh, the result is false in general. And in fact, I, I say it's uh, sharp. In fact, we, we have a result which is not about real analytic functions. But it's enough, enough to assume that the maps, maps are C3. So it's, there's nothing global about the maps. There's nothing, uh, they're just sort of C3 maps. And there's some uh, very big additional assumptions which I won't uh, state here that you need. Simply because it's not real analytic, you need to say something about orders and something else. Uh, so, so anyway, the, the, the upshot of this is that you have something really very global and very kind of smooth that is kind of, um, and so it's a kind of a universality structure that you obtain. And uh, this program was, uh, or this kind of question was advocated and actually also stated as a kind of program in the, one of the lectures that I also attended of Sullivan in the 80s. And uh, this was in relationship to his work on uh, realization uh, at the time. And in fact, more or less parallel and probably not independently, but Michel Mann also asked the same question for circle maps which had a critical point. And uh, there he had also applications in terms of uh, classical formal surgery. And so the same kind of question was uh, asked at about the same time, probably even the same year. Um, and of course there are many partial results. I mean there were uh, the results in the 80s uh, by Misha Hamann and Schwantek for circle, critical circle homeomorphisms and for uh, Sullivan for uh, counter sets, you know, some uh, properties about counter sets and uh, the, the conjugacy is not global, quasi-symmetric, but just on the counter set, it's quite symmetric. So it's a sort of more partial result. And of course, there were these uh, spectacular results by Lubitsch and Grasik Schwantek for the quadratic case. And, um, and then uh, there were papers, uh, and they, here in this case, uh, the, the result was stated, uh, was proven for polynomials. And, um, and the presence of critical points, as I mentioned, is crucial because if you take two diffeomorphisms of the circle, then they don't actually need to be quasi symmetrically conjugate, even if they're conjugate. <laughs> so having a critical point tells you that somehow the dynamics is, is dominated by this critical point. Critical points are really changing the situation. And um, also you could say, well, why did you not try to prove something more than 
fast and symmetric. Well, if you say it's C1, it's simply not true. If two maps are the same up to C1 conjugacies, then in fact the multiplier for the two fixed points, say, have to be the same. <coughs> because if the conjugacy is smooth, then derivatives also have to be the same as, for example, fixed points. And so that's not going to be the case. The topological conjugacy doesn't have to be C1. And there are actually very many sort of results which are about non-real polynomials, complex polynomials. And uh, these are, uh, for example, the Karl Lubitsch has a result which uh, uh, actually Misha already talked about this morning. And there's some other results uh, which are all uh, about complex uh, polynomials. But in general, there it's um, a, a very tricky question. And uh, it's also very closely related to the local connectivity of the model of the ground set. So in the complex, it's probably not so easy to obtain this. But in the real, actually, it turns out to be true. And so I'm going to um, explain something why this is actually the case, or the why of the, the, the mechanism. And the first kind of issue there is some sort of compactness. And uh, Michel already talked about it this morning. And this is something about, if you look at high iterates of the map, for example, if you take a quadratic map and you take high iterates, the map, the graph will go up and down. And of course, to get any kind of control is, is going to be highly difficult. Any sort of formulas don't help, help you at all. And so you need to have some kind of compactness, a more abstract argument. And um, it turned out, and this is perhaps somewhat of a surprise, that it's useful to go to the complex. Remember, we started with real maps, even C3 maps. There's no complex structure there at all. And yet, it's useful to extend these maps in some way or other to the complex. And so, for example, if the maps are real analytic, then of course there is a complex extension to a small neighborhood of the, of the real interval. And then what you do is you say, well, let's take first return maps. So you take a small interval, and you look at the first return maps to that small interval. And so that's something where you have an interval and this uh, first return map will have many different components of the base of the domain. And you want to kind of complexify that. And I'm going to draw a picture in, a, in here. So here is an interval, and maybe here also. So these are three intervals. And if you look at the first return map, restricted to the real line, this thing may map to the whole interval here. This one may map here, but actually, when I say that, here's a crooked point, the, the dark dots here, means a crooked point. So on the real line, this would sort of fold in some way. But as a complex, it would sort of branch cover the image. And this complex box mapping is something, simply something that actually has the property that U maps to V, of course, into view, but if you take a component of the domain, then it maps to a component of <coughs> the range, or maybe equal to a, a component of the range. For example, this one simply maps onto here. Now, even having this structure is not automatic. If you have a real analytic map, why should you be able to make, have such an extension? So this requires some, some significant amount of work to even know that you have such a complex problem. <coughs> But of course, having such a complex mapping, box mapping as such is not going to be enough. You need something more. You need some kind of estimates. And these estimates are basically some kind of control, universal control on the shape and the position of components of the domain as compared to the range. So you need some kind of understanding of that. And this can be made precise, but I won't do that here. And then, so then the, the, the most general result um, is the following, which was obtained again with uh, Trevor Clark and uh, Sophia Treo, one of my PhD students. And uh, it says that you can construct a complex box mapping having these bounds. Uh, in fact, Misha calls this a priori bounds. On arbitrarily small scales. So if you go deep down, of course the return map will be more complicated. And to know something about the, 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 the bounds is going to be not for free. You need to sort of obtain that. 
And uh, well, there are actually previous results <coughs> by this uh, by Sullivan and uh, you know, myself and some others. And uh, so at least some of these here. But I, this is of the more general results. And um, uh, and actually, I want to emphasize that this, for example, this complex box mapping or these a priori bounds is one of the key ingredients also in minimization theory. This is kind of what drives this whole mechanism here. And um, complex bounds actually give you more information than having real bounds. Real bounds we actually obtained some, quite some time ago, but that's actually not going to be enough. And then actually what we need here is also that even if you have C3 maps, you still have something like complex bounds or complex box mapping. Of course, the map will not be analytic, holomorphic, but it will be almost holomorphic in a sense that I won't explain here formally, but it's going to be more and more holomorphic the closer you to the real line. And uh, so you, you still have this structure here, and going to the complex turns out to be extremely useful. And to explain a little bit more about the complex uh, uh, bounds, um, one way of doing it uh, is the so-called enhanced nest construction, which is in the next bullet point. And if you use a, a, a remarkable result by Karl Lubitsch, then in fact, if you have a, some box mapping on one level, then you will obtain these box mapping on all level with bounds, with these complex bounds. So that's actually in the case where you have a, a non-renormalizable map. And let me just explain first what this enhanced nest is without detail. It's taking simply a sophisticated choice of puzzle pieces. Remember you had this map from, from U to V and you had the domains and you can look at pre-images of domains under this map and these are called puzzle pieces. And it's a some sophisticated choice of puzzle pieces and maps, iterates of the maps, so that you map one level a much smaller level to a much bigger level with a degree which is bounded. So the number of times it's going to wrapping around is bounded by some universal number n. And moreover, this choice is made so that you can actually transfer information from the top one to the bottom one very efficiently. <laughs> so it's a very uh, precise uh, choice uh, which allows you kind of to go from one level to the next quite efficiently. And if you choose another uh, uh, make another choice, then these complex bounds are simply not true in general. So it's really crucial to make a, uh, sort of a good choice of this. And so, as I mentioned, in the renormalizable case, if you use this uh, enhanced, enhanced nest construction, you can actually obtain something from this lemma, uh, this remarkable lemma by Karl Dubich, um, and obtain these uh, complex bounds at arbitrary deep levels. Actually, if the map is holomorphic, if the map is C3, of course you're going to struggle. Because then you're going to lose more and more because the map is not going to be as good. And so actually that's one reason why you don't succeed. And another reason, of course, is in a normalizable case, you have to really do something every level from scratch. And this is uh, you know, what we, we do there. And then how to prove quasi-symmetric rigidity? Well, roughly speaking, what you do is, uh, well, we use actually the technology uh, by this uh, joint paper with Kozlowski and uh, Weishau, and uh, also with the uh, paper uh, with Gennady uh, Leben. And it, what basically you do is first you prove something on a very small scale, and then you kind of glue these small scales together. And um, so each of these steps require significant care. And in fact, particularly if you have several critical points, because several things can interface. So some things map to here, and then they go back. And so this gluing part is going to be uh, uh, you know, much more, uh, uh, let's say, hassle. And, uh, or, 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 yeah, actually, it requires quite a lot more. And in the C3 case, as I mentioned, you have this asymptotically holomorphic structure. And one of the issues that we have to deal with is that high iterates will become rather non-holomorphic. And we have to find that in order to obtain still good enough uh, information. So what I discussed so far is quasi symmetry and more or less why it holds. And the aim now is to uh, explain why it's useful. And my plan is then uh, to kind of give two examples or two applications 
And they're both uh, showing that this quasi-symmetry allows you to use a lot of tools from uh, complex analysis. And this is really because of this notion of quasi-symmetry. So this quasi-symmetry, in some sense, gives you a full opening. And of course, uh, a third application, which I won't discuss because we don't have it yet, but that's really the hope, <coughs> is that you have a resolution of the one-dimensional pilot conjecture in uh, full generality, meaning not just in the quadratic case, or in the unicritical case, but even in the multimodal case. So that's uh, the hope, of course. And um, so, first application is about um, uh, hyperbolic uh, maps. And the uh, notion of hyperbolicity was explained already by Misha, and it's saying that uh, almost, uh, uh, almost every point goes exponentially fast to a periodic orbit or that the critical points are in the basin of the, the tractus. And um, then I'm going to um, uh, simply say that this notion comes from the classical stuff of, of Smale, and it's, it's saying, well, this is really an important notion because it applies structural stability. Um, it's a very mild additional structure there. And now for two and Smale already uh, conjectured that this is going to be dense, and Smell's conjecture was an arbitrary dimension, of which it, of course, turned out to be false. But actually, in general, this is going to be, uh, uh, in the one-dimensional case, it turns out to be true. And of course, uh, Kostlowski, Shen, and myself had uh, this it's a result that real polynomials can be approximated by <coughs> polynomials of the same degree, which are hyperbolic. And also that if you take a smooth map, then you can approximate it by a hyperbolic smooth map. And um, this solved the, the, the problem for the 21st century. For, um, and Lasse Remp and myself actually showed that this is also going to be the case for transcendental maps. For example, and I actually won't sort of show this because I think I'm going slower than I, I thought, and I must say, if uh, I shall have time to. Um, so, for example, it works even in the Arnold family. Even if you take non invertible maps from the Arnold family or the trigonometric polynomials, that also works. And so, um, um, and then um, I'm going to skip this. And um, here was uh, my attempt to give a short proof of something, but uh, I'm going to skip that. And then the second application is to do with uh, a monotonistic, monotonistic conjecture. And um, this monotonistic conjecture was post, uh, postulated by, uh, by Milner, Jack Milner, in the 90s. And um, it's saying that if you look at the set of parameters for which the map, uh, a real polynomial, has uh, a given topological entropy, then that should be connected. So in some sense, the, the most simple way that this family could evolve, that you could say, well, uh, you, the, 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 there's a kind of strategy in the, there. And a first version of this was already proved in the uh, 80s uh, for the quadratic case, and the Milner Tosser proved this for the uh, cubic uh, case. And in fact, this uh, set is totally far from trivial because, uh, for example, it's non locally connected. <coughs> and then um, the uh, thing that I want to, uh, the last slide I want to show here is that if you take the space of polynomials which are real, and all its critical points are also real, and in this interval, the, the invariant interval, and you also uh, do something like that. If you take the left hand side and it, it's increasing, and then you say it's uh, epsilon is one or decreasing epsilon minus one. So, within this space of maps, level sets of entropy or isentropes, maps with the same topological entropy, are connected. And the main tool here is quasi symmetric rigidity. And uh, one hope we have is that we can drop this condition about all critical points in this interval, that you can take arbitrary real polynomials. But what we already know is that even if you take maps which are far from quadratic, that's uh, for example transcendental, then actually the topological range is, is monotone. So and then I'm going to pass on uh, to Vaisho, uh, who's going to talk about the properties. OK, before the second part. Uh, I will say some words about the visual 
He was born in 1975 in Arpa province, China. Graduated from University of Science and Technology in China in 1995. Uh, he got PhD from University, University of Tokyo in, uh, in 2001. After working in University uh, of Huawei and the University of Science and Technology of China, he is now currently a professor at National University of Singapore. So, please. Thanks. Oh, I'm trying to finish it on time. So, we are going to pass to discuss orbotic property of one dimensional dynamics. So, I will start with, by recording the famous Lubitsch's regular or stochastic uh, dichotomy. So, that's for the quadratic family. Let me write the quadratic family in this form. Uh, so, the parameter A is taken in the range from 0 to 4. Then this defines a unimodal map from the, the uh, interval 0, 1 to itself. <coughs> so Sebastian just told us uh, this uh, known before that. So the hyperbolic parameters they are form an open dense subset in the whole parameter space. But on the other hand, uh, even before that, Jacobson in the 80s already shown there is uh, some subset in the parameter space with positive limiting measure. The for, for which the corresponding map is actually far from hyperbolic. It actually has an orbotic acid. Acid means uh, it's an absolute continuous environment. So once a map has an acid, then for almost every uh, orbit, then the visiting frequency of the orbit to any sub-interval of the phase space zero 01 actually is exactly given by the measure of the absolute continuous environment. So the system is quite uh, chaotic. So what exactly Jacobson shown was he looked at the parameter 4 and the nearby to prove the stochastic parameters A is uh, actually the point 4 is a one side limited density point of A. And the regular or stochastic dichotomy of which he says the H and A are basically the only cases if we are uh, happy with uh, talking about typical elements. So it means uh, you have a H, the hyperbolic parameters, and the stochastic parameters. We take the union, is not the whole space, but uh, up to a set of limit uh, measure. So this is a major step in solving Pallis conjecture for unimodal maps. So Pallis conjecture generally requires for look at the general smooth family of, uh, say, in one D case. For interval maps, we aim to show for almost every parameter the F lambda dynamic system can be understood, well understood from probabilistic point of view. So more precisely, it claims there are finitely many physical measures, so either they are ASIPs or they are supported on purely objects. So that the basins of these measures are covered in four phases, uh, up to a certain measure. Moreover, claims the system, the probabilistic property of system is actually stable under random condition. So in the unimodal case, the work after Lubitsch, done by Avila Di Mello Lubitsch and Avila Morella, they actually proved the policy conjecture is correct for unimodal maps with non-degenerate critical points. So actually, uh, so Amila and Murila proved the spheres on the Lubitsch theorem by saying for almost every stochastic parameter, actually QA satisfies some stronger geometric condition, what we call it Ekman condition, and thus is a stochastic step by the result of the Balaki and Gila. So for unimodal maps with uh, degenerate critical points, the program is actually almost uh, completed to the same maturity. So the final step done by Avila and Lubitsch. But the multimodal case, I think it remains a major challenge in real one-dimensional dynamics. So in the following, what I plan to do is to discuss some partial results towards the Paris conjecture for multimodal maps. So I'm going to discuss if uh, I'm able to do it, uh, existence of ASIPs and some expansion properties which is responsible <coughs> for the existence and some stochastic stability and the generalization of Jacobson. So all these results, we are going to try to push forward, push the real analytic method as far as possible. So let me first, uh, I hope, we hope at some point, uh, so far we are not able to apply complex techniques. But we certainly hope at some point we can make the real and the complex meet. So let me talk about a little bit about uh, the difference between unimodal and multimodal case. So let's look at the Jacobson theorem. There are actually many proofs of Jacobson theorem. Um, for example, there are famous extensions given by Benitez Carlson and Suji. 
But most of these proofs, they use a purely realistic method. So they show is, they look at starting with a map, non hyperbolic but uh, very expanded, almost hyperbolic, almost expanded map, and look perturb it, and look at whether some expanding property persists. If you can prove a su suitable expanding property persists, then you can construct some kind of a parameter phase relation, and then prove the Jacobson system. But to prove uh, Pali's conjecture, we have to start with an uh, arbitrary map, not a map with a strong expanded property. With some maps, they don't have strong expanded property. In the universal case, this was done by Lubitsch using a complex method. His method used a complex method, basically the main stuff is called a holomorphic motion. In everything to start uh, from an uh, arbitrary non hyperbolic maps, but it's a unimodal case. The problem in high in model case is the phase the parameter space become high dimensional. It is uh, so far it's not clear how to obtain the regularity of the parameter phase relationship starting with a general type of image. So if we start with a very strong with a map with a very strong expanding map, then some real method will work. But the complex method is at this moment we don't know how to make it work. So let me talk about the uh, existence of uh, ASICs. <coughs> So what is needed for exists as if this problem actually was studied uh, by many people. For example, there are results by Bowen in the 70s for mm -hmm. the simple case and the post-critical orbit are finite. Something done by Lubitsch, by, uh, by Nisilevich, is the case when the crit critical set are non -recurrent. And for unimodal maps, the more better results are known. The result by Colette Ekman and the Nomis transfer. So all these uh, results, they post some condition on the critical orbit, and this condition will imply the existence of uh, ASICs. So let me uh, pose this condition, discuss this condition. It's again a condition on the critical orbit, so it's weaker than all these conditions I just stated. So let's say a smooth map satisfies, uh, let me say, it's a large derivative condition. We write just LD, that means just a derivative of critical value go to infinity in absolute way as n go to infinity. So we proved under this condition the ASIC exists. So the unimodal case was uh, done before. So the work was done <coughs> by us, uh, joint work with Bruin and the Rivalade. <coughs> uh, there are many ways to prove this without. Uh, at least I know quite a few. I'm going to present uh, <coughs> A proof given by Rivella Tria and myself using the method of induced. So we are going to construct the induced Markov map and the capital used by capital F. Then the step is the first we have to show the capital F have an ASIC. So to do this, we need to get the distortion estimate of capital F, or we have to construct the F, we have to let, make it <coughs> satisfy this condition. Then to get a Inward measure for the original map at small f, we need to show something extra. The reducing time has to be some. I will make it slightly more precise later. To do this, we have to quantify the expanding properties of the small, the original map. So this is the quantification. Thing. So it's a little bit technical, but then we try to explain. Let's start with a map with the LD condition, and for simplicity, let's assume all critical points are non then this lemma actually gives uh, expense property of first return maps to epsilon neighborhood of the critical set. So the way epsilon here is just to the epsilon neighborhood of all the critical points. So this gives, take any FS3 inside the epsilon, look at the first return time, then you get the lower bound for the uh, Let me just uh, explain here a little bit. So here, lambda epsilon is a constant dependent epsilon. When epsilon is small, this is big. And this term, when x is close to the boundary of the epsilon, it's just a constant. Okay, when x is not too close to zero, it's a, it's a constant. And we have an extra exponential term. <coughs> so this gives uh, an <coughs> estimate on the uh, lower bound of the derivative of the first term maps, and in turn it can uh, get, from here it can get the derivative as lower bound for an uh, arbitrary object. And there are other formulations of this property. For example, you can use uh, the, the terminology of relativity here, called backward conjecture. I wouldn't define it. 
but roughly it means if you pull back the lead channel, if you meet a critical point, then you get an interval much smaller than this. These two conditions are actually equal. And these will be shown, uh, used to show the fast decay of branch in the using that with the long term. Uh, actually, the, this BC and LG, this, all these statements I mentioned, they're actually all equal. So the inducing map is uh, just like this. You have, it's a map mm -hmm. defined almost everywhere in an open interval. So the, the domain JJ here, uh, there are open sub-intervals of I, and each branch is a different model. And it has uh, this kind of bounded distortion property which guarantees the capital F of ASIF. It's induced by small f, that means each branch is just an iterate of a small f. Then the best thing we can get is like this. We can construct our induced Markov map. Moreover, we not just show its summability, we can show its uh, some much better tells. Actually, this will enable us to get a finer description of the uh, statistical property of this. Uh, so far, we discussed uh, the expanding property of uh, a map with LD. So that now let's uh, perturb it and see what happens. But to do that, it turns out I have need a need uh, a stronger condition, slightly stronger condition. Uh, let's say a smooth interval map is a summable with term one. That means for every critical point, the critical value, the derivative, if you take it's uh, take the reciprocal, the then it's summable. So it's stronger than just uh, the very good infinity. <coughs> and to look at the perturbation, that means we're looking at a pseudo orbit instead of true orbit. So that's a epsilon pseudo orbit just means it's a, it's a sequence to the next one, and it's not just exactly equal to the image of the previous one. They may, might differ by, by amount up to epsilon. Then, so under the stronger condition on the map F, the estimate will get is the same but not for random orbit. Then we can uh, do something. So for the random orbit, we get the same kind of expansion property. So that may enable us to construct something similar uh, to ASIC in the random set. And that will enable us to prove uh, stochastic stability. So when you have a, a summer condition, summer, F is summer, is the most important condition. Mm -hmm. I believe the problem of stochastic stability should uh, it deserves more attention because uh, somewhat even for this simple map, this is the manual for mu map. Probably physics talk about it quite a lot. In mathematics, this is simply a it's a very simple non-uniformly expanding map. It's expanding uniformly expanding except it has a one-sided parabolic point. Even for this map, the stochastic stability was only shown quite recently by, by us. So let me talk about another uh, application of the expanding property for the rent for the pseudo orbit. So I'm going to try to discuss uh, some extension of the Jacobson theorem. So uh, let me record a map X satisfied the Collet Ekman condition, that means every critical value has a positive lower the system. So let's look at a uh, general one parameter family. It's a one parameter family of interval maps. Let's assume uh, critical points are non-degenerate. I want to show, look at how many parameters are set by collective condition. So I start with, a, suppose the starting map is summable. I want to use the expanding property of F0. And I assume that time is has uh, set by some parameter transversality condition. Then you can show <coughs> for maps nearby the parameter zero, actually call it, call it Ekman parameters are quite low. The zero is actually a, a level dense point of a call it Ekman term. So you start with F naught, then you use the estimate for the random, random for the field obvious, you can choose this. So the transversality condition actually is the same as you used uh, in the G spec in nineteen ninety six. In this case it assumes F, F0 satisfies the, itself satisfies the collective Ekman condition instead of uh, the weaker sum condition. Moreover, we assume some kind of a smooth <laughs> condition. 
So this result, if we restrict it to the space of uh, polynomial maps, say PD, uh, is the space of the real polynomials of degree D, say map 0, 1 to itself. Then, actually, the transformative condition automatically holds for a generic and potent rock summer degree. So this means uh, the theorem has this corollary. So in PD, uh, in the space of the degree D real polynomials, so every sample can be almost there. This is a mistake. Almost every should be almost every sum of maps satisfy the polytech map. So this somewhat uh, supports that a strong version of Polish conjecture might be correct. So the strong version says that maybe almost non-normalized maps actually satisfy the polytech map, not just uh, uh, have acid and stochastic stable, even satisfy a stronger um, geometric condition. But so far, this method would push to the real method, but this doesn't allow us to prove the policy project. And the current goal, we're trying to do something more, uh, much more modest. We want to prove that maybe almost every uh, amount class of non-universal maps, we want to prove <coughs> almost every map with the large derivative condition satisfies the quality of the in other words, we want to show, prove a theorem similar to the last theorem I discussed, but only assume f naught is a satisfied LD instead of some big condition. So, so the so, uh, conjecture we would like to formulate like this. Well, let's look at the space PD, uh, degree D real polynomials. Take a map in the interior, and we uh, conjecture that f naught is a Lebesgue like dense point of called the economic maps if and only if F0 satisfies large diverging condition. So I believe this can be proved in the unimodal case using uh, Lewis uh, complex method. And using purely real method, I believe it's not possible. We hope to combine real and uh, complex method to solve this conjecture. And uh, maybe that will contribute to a full solution to the one-dimensional Paris conjecture. Uh, probably. In the next I ICM, in, which will be held in Brazil, this is the home of Jaco Palace. Maybe that's a suitable place for someone to present a full solution to the Palace conjecture in the, for modern modern Thank you. Okay. We have seven minutes for questions. So I. A clear description of the parameter space in terms of the puzzle, which at least is combinatorial. So, how do you understand parameter space, multi dimensional parameter space? Uh, I believe the pair puzzle is uh, doable, at least in some cases. You can construct and some kind of parameter to face space the map, at least in some cases, you can, you can define. But it is certainly not quite conformal. So so what you place is modular this kind of things can do. So you're looking the slices. Oh, we, you want to yeah, if we look at the say one parameter slice, mm -hmm. then there is a problem like uh, in your argument there is some kind of a four four family argument. We still don't know how to deal with it. So we can also ask, ask a question for the first speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Is there any more questions, comments? Okay. If you know, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> we have uh, two gifts from the organized committee. Okay. So, the session is closed. <laughs>